Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome uh, to uh, all of you to UCLA and Cathay Bank's Economic uh, out, uh, Outlook Virtual Seminar. I'm Kirk Malmrose, uh, Executive Vice President and Director of Commercial Real Estate and Construction Lending here at Cathay Bank. Uh, some of you may be new to Cathay Bank, so I'd like to give you just a brief overview of our depth and reach. Uh, Cathay Bank uh, started over 62 years ago, uh, has $23 billion in assets. We operate in nine states and focus primarily on gateway markets, including Southern and Northern California, uh, Seattle, Las Vegas, Houston, Dallas, Chicago, New York, the New York metro area, Boston, and Washington, D.C. We also have representative offices in Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. In addition to real estate, we offer a full suite of banking services, so recommend that you uh, talk to, to your banker. Please reach out if you'd like to have any additional information. Uh, now for the start of our session, it's my pleasure uh, to be here today for the seventh consecutive year as we join forces with uh, the UCLA Anderson forecast to delve into the U.S. and economic economy. Uh, this year, our focus continues to examine the uncertainties that shape the economic landscape. Uh, right now, we find ourselves at a crossroads of unprecedented challenges and opportunities, and today's insights uh, aim to guide us through this uh, complex terrain and uh, uncover those opportunities. Uh, Dr. Jerry Nicholsberg, uh, the director and senior economist for the UCLA Anderson forecast, will once again guide us with his expertise, uh, leading our examination into the intricate dance among the U.S., uh, China, and the global economy. Uh, our seminar will also explore uh, critical topics such as international trade, uh, supply chain dynamics, the repercussions of Evergrande's liquidation on China's, on China's real estate sector, and also the trajectory of the U.S. housing markets and regional economic performance. Additionally, we'll investigate the future of artificial intelligence uh, and its far-reaching economic impacts. Uh, finally, I invite you to check out our 2024 U.S.-China Annual Economic Report, which will be posted soon on our website at cathaybank.com under Insights by Cathay. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn uh, the call over to uh, Dr. Uh, Jerry Nicholsbergs. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, now to you, Jerry. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be here with our friends at Cathay Bank and to be talking about the latest developments in the U.S., in China, and U.S.-China economic relations. So what I want to talk about today is uh, the U.S. and China's economies, as was previously stated. Uh, I do have an apology, which is uh, I worked on the Chinese portion of the slides at home, and for some reason they didn't transfer through the cloud here. But I know what I want to talk about with respect to China. So we'll have fewer slides there, but we'll cover the same material. So let's uh, let's start with with the roadmap. We're going to start with the U.S. and talk about the macro uh, outlook. And then we're going to go and talk about interest sensitive sectors in the US, what's happening there, and why, with all of these increases in interest rates, in fact, we did not see a recession, but uh, on the contrary, we saw robust economic growth. And, and then we're going to talk about China's economic stress. And kind of the main theme here is that we are looking at a world uh, where the two largest economies, China and the US, are moving in different directions. And while that's happened before, and I'm gonna illustrate this a little bit with Japan, uh, one of the key differences here is that not only are the internal economies moving in different directions, but the two countries uh, are beginning to decouple their relations. And so when this happened with Japan, for example, uh, in the last decade or decades, if you will, uh, Japan and the U.S. were still allies, so there were kind of ways to mitigate that. Uh, and here we've got a situation which uh, is really a new territory. Uh, so now, uh, jumping into the macro outlook, this is for the U.S. And what you see here are GDP growth rates and their seasonally adjusted annual rates. And uh, if we go to the left of that vertical line, uh, you'll see the last two quarters, uh, and these are actuals of 2023, were 4.9% growth and 3.2% growth. So the U.S. economy has been growing rapidly, 
Uh, it surprised many who were calling for a recession during this period of time because that's anything but a recession. Uh, and that growth uh, creates inertia that has moved into this quarter. So we're projecting a 2.2% growth rate this quarter. It's a lower growth rate because inventory accumulation is basically flat. And because back east, uh, there have been a variety of storms that has slowed down the production of housing. It hasn't changed housing dynamics, but of course, storms, snowstorms uh, do interrupt the beginning of the construction of new homes. So we see that in the data. We saw also see the effect of weather on uh, retail sales in January. Uh, but those are things that are not really to be worried too much about in terms of economic growth. So we have 2.2%, but then we're going to decline in our growth rates to 1.5% and 1%. That weakness is not indicative of a recession, but rather of capacity constraints. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to go up to 3.4% and back to trend growth. So a pretty good economy going forward for the U.S., Uh, and one of the concerns, of course, is inflation. We have an economy uh, with 3.9% unemployment, so that's full employment. And, and here you see, again, the vertical line is the difference between for, uh, forecast on the right and actuals <laughs> on the left. And we have uh, headline uh, inflation, so that is the consumer price index for uh, all goods that the, that households buy on average in the U.S., and core, which takes out the more volatile food and energy component of uh, the measure of inflation. The February numbers come in at 3.8% for core and 3.2% for headline as that black line turns into the blue line. And these are basically the same as we had in January. And so the, you know, there's about one-tenth difference. That part shouldn't be of concern, but the Fed has consistently said that unless the inflation rate is 2%, they're going to keep rising, uh, increasing interest rates. But for the last few months, including the last meeting that just ended, uh, the Fed indicated that that's not the case at all, that they're going to start decreasing interest rates very soon. And we have out in our forecast uh, an inflation uh, prediction that is between 25 and 3%. So not hitting that 2% target. Why is the Fed going to moderate its increases in interest rates and indeed begin to decrease the federal funds rate if inflation rates are so high? So I want to show you a, a kind of complicated chart, but one that uh, represented, represents a decomposition of these numbers. The way in which these numbers are calculated is at one point in time, the Bureau of Labor Statistics sends uh, surveyors out to cities across the country and they survey people and they find out what they buy in an average month. And they create the, this household budget. And then each month they go out and they price that budget. And the difference between the cost of that budget this month and the cost of the budget last month uh, on a percentage basis is going to be the inflation rate. And it's common to use uh, a comparison of this month with the same month one year ago, which is the numbers that you're seeing here and, and are about to see. But we want to kind of break that down and say, well, what is it in the household budget that's driving these numbers and that the Fed is looking at saying, well, that's okay. So we'll um, move on to the decomposition. So this is uh, January 2023 to January 2024, 3.9%. The February numbers look very much like this, and uh, they just came in recently. Uh, what you see in this are a bunch of bars going from left to right. And let's start all the way over on the left. And uh, that's used car. Uh, and used cars are part of the budget, but maybe a small part or relatively small part of the average household's budget during any particular year. And uh, you see that orange block is below zero. Used car prices fell uh, from January 2023 to 2024. We move, move to the next one, which is medical services. And the blue 
is the sum of everything to the left. In this case, it's just used cars. And the uh, orange is the contribution of medical services. And so you keep moving kind of left to right. And you get very little increase in inflation. Uh, and, you know, each one of these is weighted by the percentage that they appear in the budget. So, for example, uh, even if toothpaste prices went up by 20%, you wouldn't want to say inflation is 20%. You'd want to weight that by uh, how much we spend in our total budget on toothpaste. Uh, so the only two here that are driving this 3.9% inflation are other transportation and shelter. Other transportation relates directly to the repair of automobiles and the insurance to cover that. And that's because our cars today are more sophisticated and increasingly the fleet in the US is more sophisticated with driver assist, with hybrid, with electric cars. And they take a more skilled labor force to repair them. So this other transportation and automobile repair, this is in the services part, it's not in the auto parts. Uh, and uh, increases in interest rates are not going to change that you need a sophisticated technician to repair your car. That technician had to go to school for that. This is expensive. This is not the same as someone coming out with a rent and working on your car. Higher interest rates don't affect it. Uh, and so the Fed is not concerned about that. And then the last is shelter. And shelter is a big component. It is about a third of the inflation metric, but it's the average rent that people pay and this is just renters, not homeowners, uh, is the average rent that people pay. People pay rents on long-term leases. Many folks are in rent-stabilized units. And when they come due, that is the leases expire or people leave their rent-stabilized units, the new rents are the current rents. And so they're kind of rebased to today's rents and that represents an increase. But rents, new rents, are not increasing across the country today. So this is simply a reflection of past increases in rents and higher interest rates uh, are indeed not gonna bring that down. So the Fed's looking at what's driving those higher numbers and they're saying that that's not something we can do anything about that will come down over time as these things work through the system. And, and that's why they are not uh, in the market for increasing rates. In fact, they are thinking of decreasing rates before long. Uh, here you have uh, a diagram that shows the Fed funds rate uh, in black, and then the forecast is blue with those diamonds. And we have uh, the Fed decreasing uh, four times uh, later this year and into 2025, bringing the Fed funds rate down into the mid fours. Uh, and we have the timing later in the year there are some indications that we may be a, a little too late on this and that they might start decreasing uh, sooner. Part of the reason for the decrease is that as inflation does come down, and it did come down, as you saw in the forecast, uh, to the 2.5 to 3% range, the real interest rate, that is interest rate adjusted for inflation, uh, will be going up uh, unless the Fed lowers interest rates. And so to keep financial conditions from tightening, they start lowering the rates. Now, we also have in here the 10-year. Uh, and in our previous forecast, the last time we were together, if you were on the webinar then, uh, you saw us having the 10-year going up to 5% and the yield curve going right side up. We've changed that forecast because the 10-year doesn't seem to want to go there. It wants to be in the low fours. And uh, just recently it's moved up, you know, to around 4.3, but does not seem to be headed to five at all. Part of the reason for this, and this very much relates to what we're gonna talk about vis-a-vis -vis China, is that uh, as bad as some people think the US economy is, it is head and shoulders above all other economies in the world. So uh, holders of wealth abroad want to at least move some of that into the US uh, because this is a safe place, is a safe haven for uh, funding, and that pushes down those long rates. So what we have here in our forecast is the rate stays in the mid to low fours, 
and the yield curve becomes flat and basically stays flat uh, through the end of the forecast. So right now it's kind of flattened out from the five year uh, on out in terms of maturities, and we've got it flattening even further. Uh, so moving on to interest uh, sensitive sectors and what these increases that you see in the chart here uh, have brought about in terms of, uh, uh, of the economy, we want to look first at building permits. Uh, this chart goes back to 2018. And what you see in the chart is what I'm calling the pandemic surge. During the pandemic, uh, two things happened vis-a-vis -vis housing markets. One is we had a lot of migration and that created a demand for homes in the places where people were going, places such as uh, Phoenix and Salt Lake City and, uh, and Miami. And there was a surge of building. So that's kind of an abnormal time. The other was that uh, many folks found that their housing units were too small if they were gonna work from home and they wanted more space. And so they were demanding more space, maybe moving further out into the suburbs, uh, but that also created a surge in building. We're back to kind of normal times now. And uh, so you see here, 4% uh, uh, interest rate, 4.1%, uh, that's a 30-year conforming uh, mortgage rate. And building in 2018 and 2019 was at the 1.3 million rate. Well, 1.3 million is less than the average uh, amount of building if you go back in time. So we're under building prior to the pandemic. Right now, we are up at 1.5 million. In fact, the latest numbers on these permits is above 1.5 million, which is above the historical average. And the reason for this is that people have jobs, they have money. Yes, mortgage rates are in the six and a half to low sevens. Uh, but those are affordable mortgage rates. I mean, these interest rates, as we compare them to the near zero interest rates we experienced for a while, are high, but historically they're not high. They're very consistent with the growing economy. And uh, and so people are demanding homes. But the one thing that's really different this time is that when mortgage rates were down in the 25 to 3% or even low threes, people were locking those mortgages in. And there's a resistance still to sell homes today to upsize or downsize uh, because you have to give up that 3% mortgage for a 7% mortgage. Not much inventory exists in the single family detached homes that are already built. So these folks are going out and they are demanding homes from builders. Builders are selling everything they can build, so they're building more. And so higher interest rates uh, unlike in the past, correspond now to an increase in home building. Uh, there's an important demographic fact that we have to keep in mind as well. The largest three-year cohort in the population of the United States is ages 31 to 33. It's by far the largest. And these are the folks who are in that prime age gr group for purchasing their first home. They're in the market and buying, they're creating the demand, even with these interest rates that's driving new home building. And building of new homes is an important component in creating economic growth, or the lack thereof is typically an important component of a recession. And this is one reason why we don't see a recession coming, but we have real capacity constraints as to how much growth we can get in home building. Uh, and that's one of the things that causes that slow slowing through this year until we get more construction workers. Same thing is true with automobiles. And what you see in this graph are autos and light trucks, and uh, it's kind of very volatile, uh, but we certainly haven't been overbuilding if you take your eyes from the right-hand side of the graph and kind of move it to the left, you don't see much overbuilding there. We have a shortage of cars. There was a dip there in the pandemic. It came back almost to average, and then we have the chip shortage. And, and then you move to today, and there's a kind of an effort to increase production uh, because there's a lot of latent demand. And uh, so we are not expecting, in fact, we may be even a little low, 
in, in our forecast of average production of autos, but we're certainly not expecting a decline in auto production. A third interest sensitive sector is uh, durable goods. Uh, and so this is business investment and the graph that you see here takes out defense. It also takes out aircraft because aircraft orders are volatile uh, and especially volatile with the recent problems that Boeing has had. Boeing went a number of months without orders, then they scored uh, a few big orders, and then in the last few weeks they haven't had any orders. You can kind of average that out and you get basically the same picture, uh, but we've taken that out in this graph. And what you notice here is that it's now kind of on a very shallow upward trend all the way over on the right-hand side. And in fact, for the last four months, the orders have declined slightly. But importantly, the backlog has increased. And what this indicates is that we've got capacity constraints. And those capacity constraints uh, are being addressed by bu the building of new factories that are going to be opening in late 2024 and then into 2025. And that's part of that pop you saw in the GDP growth in late 2024 is uh, moving some of this backlog into actual production. Uh, so slowing now uh, because of capacity constraints. Uh, and, and here is just an illustration of what's happening with factories. Uh, and, you know, this is really all over the country and it's not slowing down. It's part of our new industrial policy. There was just an announcement today of another uh, chip factory that's going to be built in Indiana. And so the U.S.'s uh, manufacturing capacity is growing and, and growing substantially. Uh, so let's turn to a few other sectors in the U.S. And uh, for those, we want to look at consumption, defense, and tech. And this is consumption. I'm going to draw a trend line here, this red dashed line. And what you notice looking on the right-hand side of the graph is that consumption has moved away from trend. And we talked about this three months ago and said it's not coming back to trend. And if we look at this uh, today, after the passage of another three months, going through a holiday season that many predicted uh, would be a poor holiday season, and, uh, and we have real growth in consumption. And the numbers so far for the first quarter of 2024 suggests that we're going to have a fairly strong uh, consumption in 2024 with some of that that was weakness seen in January now appearing in February as the and, and March as the as the weather improves. Consumption is two thirds of GDP demand that carries us uh, through the year and drives the economy. Uh, now turning to defense, uh, no secret the world is more dangerous, and because the world is more dangerous. Uh, countries are demanding more war material. And in fact, unfortunately, some of that war material is being used up in wars in the Middle East and in Europe and needs to be replaced. So U.S. defense spending is going up. And some of the defense spending that went up in the last year or so uh, is on projects that are going to continue uh, through this year and next and, and through 2026, because some of these have long lead time items like the building of ships and aircraft. This increase in defense expenditures, and, and it really includes uh, foreign defense expenditures because about 40% of that comes to the U.S., is unevenly distributed across the U.S. It is mostly in California, Texas, Georgia, Connecticut, some in the state of Washington and, and, and Missouri and Arizona, uh, but unevenly distributed. And so California, for example, uh, our state here, uh, will benefit disproportionately from this demand. But it adds demand to the economy and along with uh, infrastructure and the building of factories, uh, gives us an optimistic outlook for the U.S. as we go through 2024 and into 2025. Uh, now, the third sector that I wanted to look at was tech. And here is tech payroll employment from 2013 to 2024. Uh, and 
what you see is, of course, a dip in uh, 2020 when we had the, the lockdowns, and then it's grown steadily thereafter. And in fact, uh, in this last 12 months, Czech has added 3% to its labor force. So what's happening here, we've you know heard about all of these tech layoffs. What's happened is the core of the tech industry is growing, but some of the firms, firms that we know well, uh, are large firms, multinational firms. They grew, they had a lot of uh, cash on hand. Uh, they went into other lines of business. They bought companies. Some were, some of that worked, some of it didn't work. Uh, and so they consolidated and restructured as mature companies do. And that meant layoffs. Those folks who are being laid off are being absorbed by other firm tech firms that are growing. Uh, and so uh, tech is continuing to grow. And we don't see this as a worry for uh, the economy going forward. Indeed, labor shortages and increases in wages uh, provide incentives for companies to uh, invest in tech. Uh, now, let's turn to what's happening, and this is uh, particularly California-centric, but it you know really does uh, affect the East Coast ports. In fact, it's an East Coast, West Coast uh, kind of story, but we're going to look at it from the lens of the West Coast. And this is the these data are. Uh, the ports of, of Long Beach and Los Angeles. Uh, and what you see the top line are imports and the bottom line are, is exports. Uh, and if you need any more evidence that the rest of the world is not doing so well, look at the bottom line. Exports from the U.S. have declined because the economies in Japan, in China, in Europe have been in decline. But if you look at the upper one, which are imports, and imports are driven by increased economic growth, you see a big spike there in, uh, and so it's a late 2020. And then you have congestion at the ports and supply chain interruption, and so it drops off, and then it jumps back up. So this is when we were spending much more time at home, uh, and uh, we were on Amazon and other platforms buying goods because uh, a lot of the services, restaurants and entertainment and so on, uh, were close. So our options were buy goods. That drops off dramatically here. And the reason why it drops off is only partly the shift back to the purchase of services. A big part of this is that there were labor actions. There was a threatened railroad strike. And of course, it doesn't do any good to unload your containers uh, in Los Angeles, if they're going to Chicago, if you can't get them there, uh, and uh, and there was a th there was a threatened uh, or at least a attenuated labor negotiations with the West Coast dock workers. Those are done, and we're seeing some recovery at the ports, and now in the latest numbers, that recovery is beginning to go much more rapidly. And the reasons for that. Uh, are twofold. Uh, actually, they're more than twofold, but let's uh, just look at them. Uh, and, and the first is this. So traffic that was diverted to East Coast ports through the Panama Canal now finds itself congested trying to get into the canal. These are ships waiting to get into the canal, and it can cost up to a million dollars a day to keep one of these uh, large freighters on the ocean. So this is very costly. Uh, in, uh, in in time and in money. And this is due to climate change. So this is something that's not really going away uh, because in order to get through the Panama Canal in the center of Panama, you have to go through a large freshwater lake. And because of drought uh, and climate change, that lake is at fairly low levels. So you can't get as many ships through now as you could before. Uh, the second reason, and I, let's see if I have something. No, I don't. So uh, the second reason uh, is that uh, the West Coast labor actions have been settled. Now the East Coast dock workers are in negotiation. So there's now risk of a dock strike uh, in the East. So some of that traffic is coming back. Uh, and the third reason is that traffic that was going to East Coast ports from Asia through the Suez Canal now has to face uh, war in the Middle East. 
uh, attacks by the uh, Houthis in Ye Yemen. And so some of that is coming to West Coast ports. So we're seeing a distributional change in logistics, uh, and that is going to favor goods coming into the West Coast ports uh, all the way up and down. So from the Puget Sound all the way down and the transportation network moving those goods to the east. Uh, and this is going to be exacerbated by this horrific crash that uh, is closing the Port of Baltimore uh, that just happened yesterday. Uh, so logistics means a distributional change across the U.S., but the goods are still coming in. OK, so let's turn finally for, uh, for the U.S. to oil production and oil prices. Uh, and we had had oil prices uh, up in the mid to upper 80s. And what you see here on the left scale in blue is U.S. petroleum production. And West Texas Intermediate is in the orange. And, uh, and, and so what you notice is that it spiked. Uh, it spiked with, uh, you know, with the invasion of, of Ukraine and uh, with Saudi Arabia. Uh, reducing the amount of oil production. But U.S. production is now at record levels. U.S. is the largest producer of petroleum in the world. And, and so what's happened in oil markets, which I think is really significant because lower energy prices really does fuel more economic growth. And we have lower prices than we've been predicting. But what's happened is that Russia is no longer selling to, as much to Western Europe, but they're selling it to China. China's uh, buying less from uh, the West and more from Russia. So that additional production in the West that's not being purchased by China is uh, being sold to those who are buying Russian oil. And the U.S. is producing more. So all of this just means the deck chairs have been rearranged, but it doesn't really affect the markets in spite of the Saudi reductions in production. So we're fairly confident about uh, energy prices and energy product production going forward, supporting the forecast that we have. So for the U.S., we have employment and income remain strong. Investment and consumption continues to drive economic growth. We've had increases uh, in interest rates. That's about over with. And we see small decreases uh, coming. Those increases in interest rates probably kept the economy from being overheated but it didn't move us away from a full employment uh, growing economy. And we've got overlaid in terms of demand that's go going to counteract any weaknesses in the economy, new infrastructure, industrial policy and defense, uh, none of which are interest sensitive. So that's the US. Uh, and uh, you know, since there's a lot of talk about recession, uh, just remind everyone a recession is coming because it always does, uh, but that's eventually. It is not in our forecast. The data don't give us any indication that there's a near-term recession. Uh, so now, uh, turning to China and talking about economic stress, and I'm going to deviate a little bit of this uh, from the slides because of the cloud uh, issue that we had. Uh, we have a model uh, of the Chinese economy because the official numbers uh, are probably suspect. And so you see our model is in red here and the official numbers are in blue and the latest official numbers have about a 5% economy for China. Uh, this one says 5.5 is now 5.1 uh, and, and it says 1.8 for, uh, for our forecast and we've lowered that. But when we think about this, kind of moving back from sort of the formal statistics, uh, in China, you have an economy that's dominated by residential construction and infrastructure investment. And those are two sectors that are in real stress. And elsewhere in the world, when you have two major sectors that have contracted, you have a recession. The numbers are not 1%, they're negative. So although our model doesn't go negative and our you know, latest numbers are getting close to that, uh, that may be because of the way in which uh, the Chinese government 
uh, values and supports things like housing markets. So, you know, if you were to let the millions of homes, uh, and there are about, I think, 65 million homes, 65 to 70 million homes under construction, and I'm going to put that in quotation marks because a lot of that construction has stopped. Uh, but if you were to let that go on the market and uh, and be sold at whatever market prices uh, would take them off the market, uh, you would see a very dramatic drop in home prices in China. And that's very much consistent with uh, an economy that is in recession. So uh, the data are indicating really slow growth in China, but the, the economics of what's happening in China are indicating that if they're not in a recession now, they may well be before the year is out. Uh, part of the reason is overinvestment. Uh, and so what you see in this chart is gross fixed capital formation as a percentage of GDP. And the green line is Japan. And you see Japan peaks out in the 70s and, and starts to decline in the 80s. This is Japan's lost decade when they didn't have any economic growth, but it peaks out at a little over 40%. Uh, and and then you see, um, uh, we, well, we have Japan actually uh, uh, 30 years ago, so that's just taking uh, the green graph and kind of moving it to the right. Uh, and, and you see the pattern looks a lot like China's, but it's even lower than China. And then it kind of declines to where the U.S. is, and if we had uh, OECD, that would be between the green and blue on the bottom. So what you're seeing here is the Chinese economy has invested uh, heavily in uh, capacity and they have overcapacity. And this limits the amount of investment that, uh, that the economy can absorb going forward. If you've overinvested, then rates of return are very low, not very attractive. China is trying to attract foreign direct investment and, uh, you know, has had some uh, messages to the West, you know, we're open for business uh, to do that. But if rates of return are very low, that investment money goes elsewhere. So this investment that has driven the Chinese economy is now starting to dry up because of uh, low to zero to negative rates of return. And that's true in infrastructure as well. Uh, and and the uh, real estate bubble. Uh, so you look here, and this is U.S. real estate residential investment as a percentage of GDP, and, and China and, and the U.S. Uh, you might think uh, that uh, that this looks okay because China's uh, population is four times that of the U.S. So they should be building more homes, and maybe it's uh, you know as China has urbanized. Uh, that should spike at a much higher level of, uh, as in terms of a percentage of GDP. And that, you know, is certainly true. Uh, so you would expect four, maybe five, maybe six times uh, as much uh, residential construction, maybe even 10 times, but it's 20 times. And this is the, the bubble that we have seen in real estate markets. So if China has been building 20 times that which the U.S. built when the U.S. was in a speculative bubble, uh, it's not a uh, stretch to say that uh, China has too much housing and not a lot, a lot of room for growth in housing markets. That throws a lot of construction workers into unemployment. That's a real weakness in the economy because if they're in unemployment or if they're employed in you know some activity that pays them less, then consumption, which as you saw was driving the U.S. economy, is not going to have the legs to drive the Chinese economy. Uh, and, uh, and, and so let's turn to trade. Well, what about exports? And Chinese exports last month were, were up, uh, and that's because China has been discounting uh, their exports kind of as a consequence of the fact that they have overcapacity in, in their factories. And the U.S. and the EU, the two large markets that China exports to, uh, have reacted to this because there are laws in both uh, economic areas 
uh, against dumping of goods below cost. And so what you see here, uh, so just focus on the red line. The red line is uh, US imports from China and it's dropped kind of dramatically. And if you kind of parse that, uh, so for example, cell phones, uh, not so much, uh, electrical conductors, uh, very little at all. So these are places where China has basically established uh, as a country, a worldwide monopoly and things that uh, that can move more quickly uh, are moving. So things like apparel uh, and, and indeed expect in the coming yeah. years, uh, cell phones and other electronics to be coming from Malaysia and India much more than China. What this means for the Chinese economy is that reliance on export-led growth uh, is, is over with. So, you know, if we kind of add this up, infrastructure, China's over-invested uh, plant and capacity, uh, China's over-invested housing, way over-invested, and export-led growth that has been the generator of demand in China is declining. So this does not paint a very optimistic picture for the Chinese economy over the next three years. Uh, maybe negative, maybe positive. And, and there are many who think that the Chinese economy is still going to grow and has legs to grow, but it's not going to grow very fast. Uh, and uh, so this is from uh, 2019 to 2022. And these are uh, export amounts for the top 15 goods exports to China. So these are Chinese imports. Uh, and, and you see some countries, South Korea and Japan and the US are exporting more to China. And this is basically machinery and equipment. Although as foreign investment declines, expect some decline here. Uh, one of the major uh, exports from the, the US uh, and from the EU to China uh, is uh, aircraft. And with the problems of, at Boeing, that you know may not grow too much. Uh, so uh, just to conclude, uh, you know, what we ha have seen here is that the US is growing and growing fairly rapidly. And we have new technologies coming on board. We uh, have AI. Uh, which is a, a very significant transformation of not just the U.S. economy, but the world economy. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and that's going to further grow the U.S. economy. We see a Chinese economy that is struggling. Uh, and it's not that, uh, that the government doesn't understand that and that they're not looking for solutions. And China has had a lot of resilience when it has faced economic uh, difficulties in the past. So expect that. Uh, but it's going to take time to transform the Chinese economy into self-sustaining in a different way than it was self-sustaining in the past. And we're seeing a further separation of the U.S. and China in terms of trade and finance. There'll be many areas where the two countries are going to be cooperating. That's not going away. Uh, and and the interaction, the economic interaction is going to be very large. Uh, but in terms of growth in that, uh, it's going to be growth in specific areas, particularly areas where China doesn't see the U.S. as a threat and where the U.S. doesn't see China as a threat. So, for example, in China, uh, SOEs and government offices have been told that uh, they need to convert from U.S. operating systems and U.S. software to um, Chinese operating systems and Chinese software, uh, similar to kind of the things that have been happening in the U.S. Uh, so we're going to be seeing more of that. Uh, it, you know, it is a real question as to uh, what happens with this uh, bill to uh, force the sale of TikTok uh, and how China reacts to that, but that bill may may actually never, uh, in, in fact, be enacted. Uh, but I'd say, you know, real caution. Uh, one needs to do a lot of due diligence and select those growth areas in China. Uh, not 
you know, we're, we're not entirely negative on China, but we do see a major transformation and, and transformations are difficult. Uh, and we're positive on the U.S. because the transformations that are coming, uh, which are technological transformations in response to a labor shortage, uh, are going to further drive productivity in the U.S.